So, um, hello everyone, and thank you for taking some time out of your weekend to be here and listen to me. Uh, I'm Marita Arvaniti. Um, I'm a second year PhD student from Greece, currently based and studying in Glasgow. And I'm formally known by my official title, but nerd who tries to make everything about theater all the time, always. Luckily for you and for me, I don't really have to try very hard to make the Gothic be about theater, because its entire history and generic makeup have already done most of the hard work for me. And thanks to Sam and Romancing the Gothic, I get to try and pull some of it together for you. Um, quote from Michael Gamer's Romanticism in the Gothic, a nature heterogeneous Gothic texts regularly contain multitude modes of multiple modes of writing, shifting from novelistic prose into poetry, insert oral narratives, didactic fables, or pantomimic and dramatic spectacles, which, as you might guess, is great fun for me and my dramatic agenda. So um, before I start, a quick warning. Um, the performances I will be discussing both include scenes of sexual assault, and each director chooses to portray that differently. I will not be showing any clips for, uh, from that scene of those performances, but the depiction of rape on stage will be discussed, especially with regards to um, the first performance that I will be discussing. I will flag it just before, and I will have a slide that, you know, after that slide disappears, it is safe for you to listen again. So, the problem with talking about theatre in a context such as this one is best described through surrealist artist René Magritte. This is not a pipe, and this is not theatre. Viewing of the recording of a performance is neither the same thing nor particularly comparable to the experience of being an audience member for a live one, watching a performance unfold in front of you. So nothing included in my presentation is a real thing, actually. There is no real here except, I guess, me, giving an impromptu performance of academic competence. So I guess if by giving this presentation, I am in fact performing, and even though the pictures and quotes that I use aren't theater in and of themselves, through me, they are in fact retransformed. Sorry, I was giving everyone a chance to groan. That is the expected result of this. Um, let's call it a joke and be kind to me. Um, I usually have a lot of memes and stuff like that to have some crowd interaction when we do that face to face. Um, and, you know, um, I do not remind us of the face to face times like uh, theatre is one of the areas hit hardest by the current pandemic, and one of the most unavoidable reasons for that is this importance of having the full theatrical experience. For better or for worse, the general audience will not always pay to watch a recorded performance, and live theatrical events conducted by, by a Zoom are still viewed with hesitation. Gothic drama in particular is even more tightly tied to that sense of liveness that is unavoidably transient, aiming to evoke feelings of fear and disquiet, disquiet to its audience that, in many cases, prove way more lingering than the performance itself. This is something we will return to later with one of the performances that I need to dissect. For now, time to abandon the memes and move to everyone's favorite thing of all, a brief historical overview. Now, as you all well know, the Gothic is a notoriously slippery concept to define, especially if, like me, your research is only tangentially connected to it. Like the monsters that populate it, Gothic is transgressive and disruptive. It escapes easy categorization, directs havoc in carefully compiled academic taxonomies. Helpfully, so is drama, which makes their intersection particularly challenging. Uh, when talking about Gothic drama, or stage Gothic, or Gothic theatre, we might be referring to a couple of slightly different but connected things. First, Gothic drama can be the drama produced in the specific historical moment 
in what we now call Gothic literature was in its cultural zenith, the late 18th and early 19th centuries. In the first chapter of his book, Terror and Pity Reign in Every Breast, Gothic Drama in the London Patent Theatres, 1750 to 1820, Paul Ranger notes that the Gothic was not a movement in the sense that it was built on clearly formulated principles. Instead, it can be thought of as an artistic climate assimilated by practitioners of a range of the creative arts. Gothic, or ranger, was in the air of the time, a spirit moving where it would, and it found equal expression on the stage as it did in the pages of a novel. The stage Gothic drama of the time was more than just an impassioned recitation of the Gothic novelist's words. Ranger makes sure to highlight the importance of the visual and the classic arts. In his Gothic drama from Walpole to Shelley, Bertrand Evans mentions its use of specialized settings, machinery, character types, themes, plots, techniques, selected and combined to serve a primary purpose of exploiting mystery, gloom, and terror. While finally, in his chapter on English Gothic theater, Jeffrey Cox describes it as the most extreme example of a new devotion to a theater of shock and spectacle as it took full advantage of advances in lighting, machinery, and staging to offer overwhelming sets and supernatural special effects. Gothic theater had, quote, a near universal appeal and thus provided a possible means through which to bridge the gap between high and low culture, or paraphrase, Gothic drama at the time manages to use this new form of popular literature to its great advantage and creates a new version of tragedy. However, this popularity would end up a double-edged blade. As to quote Diego Saglia in Gothic theater 1765 to the present, by relying on sensationalism and aimed at quick consumption, plays constituted a quickly obsolescing theatrical fair and soon vanished from cultural memory. Popular? Yes. Long-lasting? Unfortunately not. Instead, Gothic drama has a legacy of being consistently snubbed by historiographers of theater who prefer to present a canon that relies almost entirely on the shoulders of the lone creative figure of the playwright. So far, so summarized. Of course, when we talk about Gothic drama, we might also be using the word Gothic to describe a particular aesthetic of dramaturgy. That style of stage Gothic is defined by Diego Saglia tentatively as a theatrical language of the extreme, combined with the sensationalism of, of a supernatural, psychological, and political nature. When divorced from the chronological constraints of the historical definition, these can be used to describe stagings of plays from all points in the history of the medium. For example, Euripides' back hair, and Johnson's Dispute She's a Whore, Richard O'Brien's Rocky Horror Show, and Sarah Rule's Eurydice. While some of these texts are more gothic than others, all of them have been staged in a way that is entirely gothic enough, if that is what the company is trying to do. This by the way, this is one of the greatest secrets of theatre, and the thing that usually gets, gets me chased off by pitchfork-wielding angry mobs. But since this is a virtual meeting, and I doubt any of you know where I live, I feel safe to state. In a theatrical performance, the plot of the play doesn't really matter. Which is why a lot of people's initial condemnation of, say, for example, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, while not having actually seen the play perform, was quite unfounded. That is not the case anymore. And obviously, when theatres open again, please do not go and see Harry Potter and the Cursed Child because J.K. Rowling sucks. But I digress. That explains why Gothic texts so often find their way on stage and why, more importantly, they go on to find great success there. Now, I'm not claiming that Gothic novels don't have plots. If anything, they have an overabundance of them. 
Last I counted, the monk had at least 50, and every time I look back, I swear it grows a new one just to spite me. But very often, with a gothic novel, the plot is not the point of the story. The point is, in fact, the ambience, the atmosphere, the emotional resonance the gothic text has on you. And gothic theatre is great for those. In their introduction to their 2018 edited collection, Contemporary Gothic Drama, Attraction, Consummation, and Consumption on the Modern British Stage, Kelly Jones, Benjamin Poor, and Robert Dean discuss the Gothic as an ever-present feature of, specifically for them, British theatre, and the essays included in their collection cover a variety of theatrical works, both on and off stage. They consider original works of the Gothic as well as adaptations and hybridic creations that mix the original and the adapted, and they find the same playful self-awareness in all of them. Gothic theatre is a visual medium that tells its audience that they cannot trust what they see, whose use of audio distorts space, place, and meaning making. Those of you who have watched the performance of Stephen Mallorette's adaptation of Susan Hill's The Woman in Black might know exactly what I mean. For those who haven't, please do as soon as the option is available to you. I will not be talking about the woman in black for this presentation, and part of the decision not to do that is because it truly is very difficult to explain what precisely is so effective about it to people who haven't experienced it, experienced it firsthand. At least, it's very difficult to do that whilst remaining at least slightly academically objective. If you want to ask me about it afterwards, I promise to sing its praises to high heaven. But back to the point. If it's not solely the visuals that make the Gothic Gothic, and it's not solely the sound, we return again to talking about that elusive idea of the general experience, of the effect the show has for its audience. But what is that effect? We don't at all have an answer for that. The Gothic in theatrical performance can be characterized by its endeavors to appeal to the sensual rather than the rational. As with Gothic film and literature, theatrical Gothic seeks to unsettle through its effect and affect upon its audiences, evoking and invoking fear, shock, horror, claustrophobia, and disorientation. I really love that quote, and I specifically love the double use of evoking and invoking. I find it to be a lovely note to highlight the mysticism of the theatrical Gothic, the way it sometimes feels like it's even more of a ritual than other performances somehow. I don't at all want to make that difference clear when they wrote, when they write that, whilst all theatre can be, in differing ways, immersive and effective, Sensory appeal of the Gothic can trigger extreme reactions in its audiences. Trickles on the skin, screams, and at its most extreme, fainting and physical revulsion. Now that is definitely not the kind of stuff you usually aim for in a panda performance, that's for sure. Um, so at this point, I think I've given enough situational context to start looking at how this Gothic tradition and all that we've been discussing presents itself in contemporary performances themselves. So let's look at some live examples produced in the last decade. Initially, when I proposed this paper to Sam, I was going to talk about a couple of original theatrical works, but instead I'm going to look at stage adaptations or popular or notorious traditional Gothic texts. This change serves a double purpose. Firstly, this way, even if people aren't familiar with all of the performances that I will in fact be discussing, I know that the stories they are based on are not probably not alien to you, which means that I hopefully won't bore you. And secondly, this way, there's a practical answer to the inevitable, yes, but is this really Gothic question that can be asked about every single original Gothic play. When you're talking about a text by Mary Shelley or Matthew Lewis, it is much easier to nod and smile and say, yes, yes, it is actually. Can I have the next question now? Which brings us to the one contemporary staging of a beloved Gothic text that I couldn't help but mention. Oh, no, sorry, not that one. Oh, wait, oh, Mary Shelley. 
Annie Boyle's Frankenstein. The National Theatre of Great Britain presents the smash hit Frankenstein, directed by Danny Boyle. I can create people. Playing in cinemas worldwide for a limited season from June. You make sport with my life in the cause of science. Benedict Cumberbatch and Johnny Lee Miller alternate roles in this electrifying stage production. This is your universe, Frankenstein. To find venues and book tickets, visit ntlive.com. So, this adaptation of Frankenstein can easily claim the title of the most popular contemporary staging of Mary Shelley's novel, especially in the Anglophone world, but I would wager internationally as well, as it was first produced in early 2011 during the first peak of Benedict Cumberbatch's popularity due to the recently released BBC Sherlock. Nor has it been allowed to fade into obscurity. Gone is the danger of the ephemerality of state gothic, as this production was broadcast to cinemas worldwide as part of the National Theatre Life program in 2011, 2012, 2013, and 2014. It was again screened in the US in 2018, in honor of the novel's 200th year anniversary. And finally, earlier this year, it was made available to viewers at home as part of the National Theatre at Home series and is still, I believe, included in their subscription. It is also one of the easiest non-musical theatre performances to find a public of online, so I have been told by completely disreputed sources. It is not by any means of the imagination a small production. Every review makes note of the budget, which is undoubtedly impressive, even if we don't factor in the paychecks for the two leads. The performance is without a doubt spectacular, and it has spared no expense to achieve that. I do not mean to say that its success is only reliant on money. This is a brilliantly acted, especially by Cumberbatch and Miller, cleverly directed bit of theatre. It just also happens that it's surrounded by the kind of magnificent, breathtaking statecraft that can come by through either sheer creative ingenuity or a number of significantly large checks. Frankenstein, I think, had a little bit of both, and it shows. I could spend the rest of this time analyzing the different transformations the Olivier stage went through for this performance or the various bits of flashy stagecraft Boyle and the rest of the crew devised. But I will restrain myself and focus only on two key scenes that I find to be the most interesting. Those are the play's opening scene, the birth of the creature, and then the creature's revenge for the killing of his mate. The latter one refers to the scene of the play where the creature finds Elizabeth on her and Frankenstein's wedding night and kills her. As I said, I will not be sharing much of that scene, but I will let you know before I start talking about it anyway, in case you need to mute me for a few minutes. Big Deer's adaptation frames the familiar story from the creature's perspective, and therefore, fittingly, it starts with the moment of its creation, presented on stage like a birth. From the darkness, we hear a sound, described in the script like a heartbeat. A low red light fills the almost empty Olivier stage, by all accounts, a vast space. And we see the gestational sac, a thick veined membrane from within which we can see a creature, the creature, a dark shadow struggling to be born. It is a slow and arduous process, the sight of the performer emerging from within, fully grown but not in command of his own body, is difficult to watch. Cumberbatch and Miller reported using different inspiration, inspirations for their portrayal of the newly born monster. While Cumberbatch turned people recovering from strokes or brain injuries, Miller instead based his performance on his then two-year-old son, 
further strengthening the reading of the teacher as something not so much created as birth. The scene of the creature's birth continues for almost 10 minutes, an amazingly long time on stage. And in that time, no words are spoken. After the creature exits the cocoon, there is almost quiet. The only things we can hear as the audience are the slaps of the body on the stage's wooden planks, the thud of flesh hitting flesh, as the monster slaps itself, tries to stand, collapses, struggles. Frankenstein enters and is horrified, but his presence isn't important. For 10 minutes, we are focused on the creature and the creature alone. It's a natural and almost abject form, a complete solitude. It is a scene that the readers of Shelley's work are not exactly privy to, but which haunts the novel anyway. On stage, a few feet away from the first row, it makes from, for an easy viewing, invoking the very same emotional reactions that the Gothic always does. Discomfort, fear, and funnies. The bright bulbs of Bruno Poet's canopy of light stretch out over the stage. The audience's gasps are echoes of the pain sounds the creature makes as it processes light, sight, and sound for the very first time. After the painful and painfully lonely scene of the creature's birth, well, a steam engine burst into the stage. <laughs> no, really, I promise, a steam engine, seemingly breaking the spell. This is one of the moments where the recording of the performance fails, as it presents us with a number of close-ups so that we can marvel at the spectacular artifice of the moving, transforming set never providing us with a full view of the stage that the live audience would have enjoyed. The creature is lost to us after we stuck so close to him in the opening, and as a result, that small scene seems disjointed. It feels much weaker than the technically sparser moments that surround it. The creature's birth, the creature's first experiences with fire, food, and rain. The story continues, um, still centering the creature's experience up to its inevitable conclusion. Um, so from now on, discussion of the tapes will follow. So if you um, need to, please feel free to mute me until this slide disappears. Okay. So the murder of Elizabeth. Talking about it like that makes it sound like a Bernini statue or a painting. It's not. In Shelley's original novel, the creature kills Frankenstein's bride Elizabeth on the night of her wedding. Her violation is left to the reader to imagine, or not. This is not the case for the Danny Boyle staging for Nick Pierce's adaptation. The creature does not just kill Elizabeth, he rapes her too and exclaims, now I am a man. Humberbatch and Miller's creatures both truly earn the title of monster in that scene which is from the first moment marred by the horror of knowing what's about to happen. Except what we thought we knew doesn't happen. The creature, as I said, doesn't just kill Elizabeth. And the staging of the rape is painful and explicit, despite the lack of nudity. Once again, Boyle turns to sound for horror. The creature grunts. Elizabeth struggles. When Victor enters the room and fails to save her, she cries out for him. Like the creature's birth, he's man-making, his words, not mine, also lasts for a bit too long to be comfortable, and reviews have called the scene gratuitous and unnecessary. The doubling of the two actors adds another dimension to the scene, which is clearly and explicitly mirroring Victor and Elizabeth's earlier conversation that you can see on my slide. Elizabeth, portrayed by Naomi Harris for the entire production, is with her soon-to-be husband, and they talk of love, her love, of desire, her desire, and of work, his work. She asks him to touch her, which Victor doesn't immediately do. She reaches out, putting his hand on her body over her heart. Kiss me like this, she says before she kisses him. Show me how you'll give me children. Later, Victor's double will put her hand on his chest so that she can feel his heartbeat. We'll be standing at the same spot of the empty stage, the positions reversed. Creature, thankfully, won't really try to kiss her. 
Interestingly, the play's immortality has not really stretched to this scene. Like with the opening, in which the creature was initially conceived as being naked on stage, but um, wears a tiny loincloth for the recordings, so too was the rape of Elizabeth covered up, with the scene being cut slightly for the first few screenings and ending up significantly shorter in the version shared on YouTube earlier this year. In both cases, the reason seems to be the easy access of the screen version, the fear from the creators about it being seen by the wrong kind of people. Imagine that kind of people to be kids under 12, if we see the warning at the beginning of the YouTube version, or even the fans of the actors themselves, especially Cumberbatch, who, along with Miller, were the ones who requested the swaddling of the creature in the opening scene. Even in the 21st century, there are some things that are better kept to the theatrical stage, and not allowed to spread outside its darkened auditoriums. Which brings us, finally, to the monk. And the End of Illusions, an adaptation of Matthew Lewis's Gothic romance, The Monk, published for the first time in 1796. Now, The Monk was not a novel that shied away from the horrors of human nature. As Samuel Coleridge wrote, if a parent saw it in the hands of a son or daughter, he might reasonably turn pale. Described as an obscene novel, the Monk was used by critics to denounce the entirety of the Gothic genre of the time as a venereal disease capable of impressing young imaginations with gross improbabilities, unnatural horrors, and mysterious nonsense. And although literally critics of horror and the Gothic are rarely to be actually trusted, one cannot deny that the Monk hardly makes for easy, comfortable, fluffy reading material. The titular monk, Ambrosius, will deny the god that he has served for 30 years, rape and kill before the novel is through. He will not do so for power, and he will not do so for knowledge, because despite the structural, structural similarities between the two stories, Ambrosio is never Faust. He will do this for lust, for a destructive, uncontrollable desire that will affect all around him, and which will always walk hand to hand the 2016 production in Scroll Theatre is far from the first time the work has been adapted. Indeed, from the time of its publication, The Monk has inspired operas, plays, films, graphic novels, and even a musical comedy based on the novel, which last I checked was in development. As befit the representative of Gothic drama, a your use production, still, which you can see here, um, is also a clear product of its time. From the late 2000s onward, theatre in Greece has been experiencing an increase in adaptations, with works of Greek and international literature finding a new home on the stage, often to great commercial success and critical acclaim. Eleni Triada Philopoulou, who translated and adapted the monk for the stage of Spro Theatre, sees this as a sign that the boundaries that want drama and literature to be separate are collapsing. It is a shift, she claims, towards a new kind of theater, which is closer to what we may call post-dramatic theater or post-modern theater, in which opens a great gate and makes works like this utilizable. And indeed, Mavro Yoryu utilized the source material to the best of his abilities in this production, starting from his use of space. As you can see, Scroll Theater is uniquely built against a cliffside, whose naked rock inevitably references the dark catacombs in which the darkest scenes of the monk take place. It is an ideal space to showcase the dark aesthetic of Matthew Yutes's novel, and Mavro Yoryu takes full advantage of it. Rosio starts the play standing on the rock. Separated from the rest of the actors and the actual state of the production, which is the um, raised platform that you can see in this picture. Symbolically, it isn't a stretch to read this placing of Ambrosio at his own paradise, his soon to be lost Eden, and the closest he will ever get to God. After Ambrosio is tempted away from holiness by Mathilde, uh, he will leave his place on the rock and join the other actors on the platform, returning only at the end of the play when his lack of punishment endears him his guilt. 
Ambrosio's return to the rock is a visual nod to the ending of Lewis's novel, but sees Ambrosio sell his soul to the devil in order to escape torture, hoping that he will live long enough to be able to repent. The devil announces that all was in vain, as the Inquisitors were already on their way to free him, and he throws Ambrosio off a cliff, where he will die unrepentant and alone, with no hope of salvation. Even though Mavra Yoryu chooses to end the play with Ambrosius's release and not his death, his now precarious balancing on the steep rock face doesn't really let the audience forget what's truly in store for them all. In direct opposition to Ambrosius's journey further and further away from holiness comes the movement of Agnes and Don Raymond. Both actors first appear on the play's lowest platform, away from Ambrosius' spot on the rock. As their love moves further away from mere lust and desire, they climb higher and higher, although they never reach Ambrosio's initial placement. That lost Eden is incompatible with earthly love and can only be attained if one is completely ignorant of it. The small space available to the actors, as well as the lack of sets and props, gives a second set of meaning to the actions of the cast, infusing them with irony and highlighting the ever present doubling of love and death. In the stage of Scrow Theatre, Antonia's room is where her mother is murdered is the same as her tomb in St. Clair's catacomb, where Antonia is raped and killed by Ambrosio. A scene that, in direct opposition to Beer and Boyle's Frankenstein, is depicted in the original novel but is not shown realistically on stage, where the two actors instead only briefly barely touch. Similarly, Agnes and Don Raymond make love on the exact same spot where Agnes will later be tortured by the IRS, a detail only already existing in Lewis's novel, showcased and highlighted by, 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 by Mavrigur Yu's direction. Mavrigur Yu's economy of direction shines equally in his treatment of the actor's physical bodies. For Mavrigur Yu, touch equals death. As noted by Leah Zayu, there are only four instances of two actors touching each other over the two hour long performance. They are always used to symbolize death. Lack of connection during the rest of the performance makes those four touches shine, highlighting that the only true meetings that can exist between these people is are disease. They are tainted by Ambrosio's dark desires and the corruption felt spread by Matilda. With only four performers beside himself on stage, the densely populated novel by Lewis is stripped down to its very core. The mobs and crowds of Lewis's novel are not completely missing from the theatrical experience, however. Instead, they've been transported away from the stage and into the audience, surrounding the stage in direct seating. The audience turned mob is mere inches away from the platform that make up the thrust stage, have nothing to shield or distract them from the actions taking place on them. By placing the action between the two sets of seating for the spectators, Mavra Yoryu adds yet another level of power to his set of platforms. As the eyes of audience members meet over the untouching and untouchable bodies of the actors, the nature of the spectator is brought to the foreground, identified as the witness and the voyeur of Lewis's tale of obscenities. By being able to watch each other see Antonia get raped and murdered, or Agnes tortured, the audience members had the complicity of voyeurs thrown in their faces, more explicitly than if Mavra Yoryu had decided to be totally realistic in the direction of the scenes. Even without the problem of representing Lewis's chaotic mob scenes, five performers are not enough to represent all the major roles in the story. And so, Mother Your You chooses to double up the performers. Interestingly, the three male actors are always separate, and perform only one part each. Their identities are clear cut and definite, more real in a way that the women are not. Indeed, between the two of them are the two actresses that perform the parts of Antonia, her mother, Agnes, the prioress, and finally, Mathilde Rosario. The most Significant, if not exactly unexpected, of these doublings is the one of Antonia and Matheldi, demon and saint, the two sides of Ambrosius' love and lust. From the time she sets foot on the stage, veiled and bathed in blue light, 
Antonia is codified as saintly. Something as simple and innocent as her removing her veil becomes enticing, not by any acting choice on the part of the actress, but by the reaction it causes to Lorenzo, and the central place it is given on stage. The audience, due to the unusual makeup of the seating, don't all get to see her face, and those that do don't necessarily see her very clearly. Antonia is enticing in modesty, beautiful in the eye of the beholder, yet pure on this first moment, even from the voyeuristic eyes of the crowd. It is only a scene later that the, when the actress returns, this time unveiled, that we see her, wearing monk's habits that don't hide the fact of her femininity. She is now Matilde, and she is bereft of any innocence. Unlike Antonia's straight back and modest stance, Matilde lies across, across the platform. She spreads her legs, she takes up space. She seduces, and unlike most of the other characters, she isn't afraid to reach out and touch, damning those around her to death. A simple touch is enough. Now, I don't need to emphasize how different the approaches of Boyle and Mother Here You are. That you can infer simply from looking at the cast and crew lists for the plays. Mother Here You's entire cast and crew numbers only 11 people with himself doubling as the director in Ambrosio. Conversely, Annie Boyle's Frankenstein numbers 31 without counting assistants, stage managers, costumers, and the other invisible theater jobs. However, one thing is clear. Both companies transformed the original text, presenting on stage what was traditionally kept off it. Whether through spectacular extravagance or ascetic monastic fairness, Gothic remains their pole star and guiding influence, both in the text they chose and in how they decided to visualize and embody them. The real question then comes, what can these isolated examples tell us about the ways that we should stage the Gothic? The answer, perhaps predictably, is rather simple. We should stage it playfully. We should stage it unconventionally. We should, perhaps, stated unflinchingly. But what does it mean to be unflinching? Is it to add a, for some gratuitous rape scene to throw your actors naked on the great empty stage and blind them with a canopy of bright light? Or is it to force your audience to look at each other, witness their own possible complicity and their fascination while they imagine horrible things happening to the people in front of them? We can see arguments for the unflinching nature of both styles of direction. Boyle's frank addition and Mother Your Use metatextual subtraction of the violence. I have a preference. It might not be your preference. There are no right answers, I don't think. Um, by shifting the focus of the story away from Victor Frankenstein and towards his creation, Fear and Boyle change the focus of Mary Shelley's novel from one of hubris to one of love and the lack of it. Who has it and who doesn't? The creature is humanized, we see him born, we see him experience the world, we see him hurt and injured and hungry. Then, inescapably, we see him kill and rape and harm. The stage revolves and with it, so too does our perception. Those who saw the performance the second time would have noticed a second revolution, Miller's creature versus Cumberbatch's, Cumberbatch's Frankenstein versus Miller's. Always, Naomi Harris is Elizabeth, asking one man to catch her and then getting assaulted and murdered by his double. Always the same stark isolation, the same vast and empty stage of the Olivier. On the other hand, where a direct page to stage adaptation would be extravagant and busy, Mother Your Youth Spartan Economy creates an intimacy that evokes the feeling of reading Lewis's novel, a strange partnership between author and reader. This notorious work of Gothic obscenity is stripped down to its various forms, and what emerges is a deeply unsettling, unspectacle that highlights the relationship between the obscene and those who choose to witness it, between the Gothic and its readers, between a mob and us, the Gothic audience. Thank you for your time.